what do I do what I do? And, you know, and, and, and why am I on here today, you know, with Donald, on, you know, on, 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 um, on, on Mopov doing this workshop? Because he goes to one side, all of us, yeah? Forget your bank balance, forget your ego. As adults in general, especially, especially those in education, because they're the ones that are working with a few generation. We've got to think one thing here. Our kids, your kids, my kids, all the kids in this country, year after year, are getting to a point where they're going from year six into secondary school. Now, we know on the news the other day, and I put it on my Twitter, and it's been all over the news, we had five people involved in a murder, been arrested for stabbing another boy. These children were 13 years of age. 13, and that's year eight. So just two years ago, they was in primary school. Now, I'm not pointing fingers or judging anybody, I never do, but, we can, but I'm a, as a professional in education, I'm allowed to ask one question. Was these five individuals, or the boy that stabbed the other boy, ever given a knife crime workshop? Year six, year seven, or year eight? Now, I'm not saying they was or they wasn't. We're not saying that. So are we saying that, are we missing opportunities? Because I go to prisons and I speak to loads of hundreds of boys, as well as speak to hundreds of thousands of kids. I go all over the country and I go to prisons and I speak to boys. And a lot of them are, are lifers. They're in for murder. So for one, you know, they took a life. For two, their parents don't see them no more. Number three, that costs a taxpayer a million pound to keep them in prison. There are thousands of boys in prison that are serving life sentences all over the country. And you're looking, you're thinking, are oh, we missing opportunities? Now, the fundamental question I ask when I meet these boys all over the country, a lot of prisons I go to, at the end of my talk, I talk to them. Some of them are well into their sentence. You know, some of them are five years into their sentence, six years. Some of them are just finishing off. They've been in prison 10, 15 years. But the one question I ask these young men, did you ever have a knife crime workshop when you was at school? And this is the truth. Out of all the hundreds I've spoken to over the past 10 years in prisons, not one looked at me and said, I had a workshop at school. Now, I'm not saying it's the school's job to give all the kids knife crime workshops, but then where does PSHE come into this, which is next to safeguarding? So every school, everyone that works with kids is a safeguarding policy. If you look at safeguarding, safeguarding to mean protect from harm. Protect from harm. So you're telling me when a boy stabs another one to death and kills him, that's not harmful? So we have to look at our safeguarding policy, our due EF care, and we need to look at these kids and it's fundamentally important, yes, they're there to teach academics, to put them off into life, to break a bright future, to go off and pay bills, pay taxes, not live in a prison cell for 15 years or wake up in a crack den. You know, that's not where children are meant to end up into. So collectively, as adults, we've kicked off at three, you know, with Mopov and me, you know, can we over the next few years, you know, that's my plan, you know, to educate hundreds of thousands of kids, get together and convince the head teacher, the head of PSHE, the head of a year group in a school, that our kids are going through a minefield today. Drugs and alcohol, gangs, knife crime, county lines, it's not going away. It's there to stay. This isn't, a, you know, this is, you want to talk about COVID, this isn't a virus. This is something that we can never get rid of. There's no vaccine for it. Never will be. The only way we can stabilise this ever-growing problem with gangs, county lines, knife crime, alcoholism, is early intervention education. We give kids a workshop in year six, year eight, year 10, over a period of four years, because the environment changes. In year six, it's ice cream and jelly. Come year eight, there's alcohol. Come year 10, there's lots of drugs. Yeah? So we need to get these kids and not just keep giving them maths, English, history, P, because that won't keep them safe. Please believe me. Academics won't keep kids safe from what happened to me and what happened last week to them five children who are now going to go to prison probably for 15 years and one boy is going to be buried by his mum and dad. Yeah? This is about responsibility, all of us, collectively. You know, as adults, professionals, parents, to look out for the person we're going to kids, get them through that minefield, get them into college, get them into uni, and bang, bang. They go off and they live happily ever after. And not end up outside Boots' Tesco, Sainsbury's, begging with rotten teeth, like we see today. More of it, every town centre. You look now, no matter where you live, these numbers are rising rapidly. Yeah? You know, so how do we stabilise it? It's so simple. We stabilise it for early intervention. You know, let's, ignore, let's not brush this under the carpet. 
you know, most of us adults that are watching this now are pretty fine. We've all got jobs, we're healthy, we're at home. Our children, you know, are going through something now that's at an all-time high. Gangs, all-time high. Knife crime. It's on Twitter. I see it the other day. Knife crime is all-time high at the minute. So, you know, and it doesn't discriminate. This doesn't discriminate. All what happened to me, don't discriminate. It says it in this book. You know, it, I've used drugs with thousands of addicts in drug dens, and I've seen some horrific sights. Horrific. You know, I've seen women selling their bodies, you know, every day to maintain their heroin and crack habit. And these women have been in their mid early 20s. And you look at them, they look like they're 50 years of age. They've lost their teeth. They've come from all walks of backgrounds, all different religions. You know, it don't discriminate addiction. It doesn't discriminate. And these gangs don't care about these young people. You know, these county line gang members, they'll recruit anybody. They don't care. They've got no, they've got no morals whatsoever. None. You know, their main purpose is to line their pockets with lots of money at the misery of others and use young people to do that. So I hope that my little rant <laughs> or how I see life, you know, will fall on not all deaf ears. And if you do work with kids, you've got to ask yourself one question, you know, are you going to give them some loving education in terms of their personal well-being, drugs, alcohol, knife crime gangs, you know, and then uh, hopefully if you do, and it's from some of the impacts, you know, please don't think, you know, just giving some chart on the wall in the classroom is you, you need to get someone in who's got experience, lived experience. It makes it really impactful, you know. I'm not saying don't do nothing, but if you're going to get someone in, you'll have an impact, you know. Um, yeah, get someone in who's got a real hard story, you know, that's, that's really going to get the kids' attention. You know, I get a lot of feedback on Instagram and Twitter and you know, Facebook from families and children and, and, you know, I have no magic wand. None of us do. Because we did have, we'd have no problems in the world, would we? Yeah, we'd have no problems. Unfortunately, there is a problem and there is a way around it and that's early intervention education. So, yeah, you know, I'm not judging anyone. If you work with kids, please be mindful. Have a look at my website, paulhanford.com. You know, there's is, is, is enough evidence that what happened to me is going on right now more than ever. And it will continue to go on. It will carry on rising. The less we educate young, the more these numbers are going to rise. So if we look at forward in the clock 10 years, what's the numbers going to be like with stabbings and addiction and alcoholism? You know, uh, many prisons all over the country, um, you know, all over the country with different organisations. You know, I've worked in a Felton prison. I've probably been in there a hundred times um, with, you know, people like London Fire Brigade, Fulham Football Club, um, QPO, you know, they're these organisations, these charities, and they go in and they... They call it, um, um, you know, um, reduced reoffending. So basically what we're trying to say is that when these kids get out of prison, they don't go back. My experience is for me, I went to prison 15 times and I was committing crime within a matter of hours of leaving prison, you know, and I've got to look and we've got to obviously do what we can. We do know that the reoffending rate in prisons is quite high. It is quite high. You know, as we say, I think it's about 65, 70% of prisoners that get released um, end up returning, you know. Um, I strongly believe, I know there is organisations that go into prisons, the prison themselves put on something for young people to, you know, the lack of reoffending, but I'm not saying that all prisoners get it or they want it, you see. They don't have to go to these groups. There's only the small individuals that come to these workshops. Um, so, yeah, I strongly believe that, you know, um, yeah, these, you know, I read an article the other day and it was from a good source and it was saying that, you know, 70% of prisoners are come from traumatic childhoods, you know, trauma. So, you know, do, are they coming from broken homes or fatherless homes? I don't know. But do we need to show them a bit more love and not just slam the door and leave them locked up for 24 hours a day like animals? OK, they've committed a crime. They're doing their time. That's the consequence of their action. But and I know the prison system is, you know, under strain, understaffed. But, you know, we've got to show these really vulnerable young men and women a bit more love and, you know, and, and take care of them. You know, mental health, you know, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, take care of these people, you know, show them that there is a way to change. I'd love to go into more prisons and speak to, to, to as many prisoners as I could. You know, I, I remember going to Pentonville and I've done a workshop. I was there all day and I've been in that prison nine times as a prisoner. And they invite you back to the chapel. There's a big chapel in there, and and they 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 put a flyer out to all the prisoners under their door and said, "Oh, Paul, you know, uh, 
we've got a guy coming here to talk about drugs and alcohol and gangs and and they put it out to 900 prisoners and I think it was 850 I said they want to come along but unfortunately they could only have 200 because in a prison you can only have security so they let 100 in for two workshops so I spoke to 200 prisoners but they all wanted to come along some to get out of I guess for an hour and some to come and listen to me I don't know you know but the fact they all sat in there and I had these hundred men in each workshop, some of them life murderers, some of them petty thieves, all, all walks of life, different religion, coloured skin, didn't matter. Um, when I told my story, you know, these men were in tears and the feedback after was incredible. And I spent another hour sitting with them all talking questions, you know, and, you know, I was once where you were sitting in that chair, you know, in that prison cell. I got out and, you know, I did what, what was my defence? You know, I needed some help. I needed some help. I had to reach out and ask for it. And I got it. Please believe me. I wanted to rehab. They showed me nothing but love. You know, I went up to these groups and I still go to them. They showed me nothing but love. And that's what maybe was, you know, what I was lacking all them years. I don't know. Very powerful thing when someone reaches out and offers you some help, you know, and you, you have the courage to ask for it, you know. So I strongly believe when these people are in prison, we need to, or say we, society, we, you know, I know there's, Money, money's tight, funding's tight, in, you know, the prison service under strain. I understand that. I understand that. But as I said, the more we can do collectively for everybody, as it says in this book, you know, the well-being of society. Well, society means all of us. All of us, you know. So, yeah, with the prison system, I'd like to do more in prisons. I'd like to have that, you know, 80% of, you know, the 60,000 kids I speak to a year is in schools. The other... 15, 10% is youth clubs, football clubs, cricket, rugby. You know, I do a lot of stuff with the kids project with, you know, football and there's, there's, some, there's some fantastic organisations there, probably like yourself, you know, Mopov. Well, you know, come on, we, 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 we're doing our best here. Please allow us to talk to the kids. Allow us to talk to them, you know. We, we, we're trying to give them a bright future here, not a wasted one.